Today's session is Color Process Control and Verification in Fiery Pro Surfer and Fiery Excess. It is my pleasure to introduce our speakers for today. Ellie Klump, Senior Product Marketing Manager for Fiery Wide Format, and John Nate, Educational Architect and Trainer for Fiery Wide Format. We have some great content for you, so without any further delay, I'd like to hand it off to Ellie to begin. Thank you, Yael. Today we're going to take a deep dive into color process control and verification. So your customers expect that if you run a job a second time, even if there's a few weeks or, or half a year in between, um, the job should look the same to them. Um, if you have to job, um, split a job over two devices, because for example it's a rush job, the customer doesn't really want to notice a color difference. Customers want their brand colors to be accurate every time, and you, of course, also want predictable output. You might actually want to match uh, print standard, but more importantly, you want your customers satisfied, and you want them to come back with you and order again. So today, John will explain how process control and verification can help you in all these situations. Um, in the webinar today, he'll cover why process control is important, how it works, really the theory behind it, um, also how process control can tell you it's time to take corrective action when it's time to take action to put your color back in check, um, which tools are available in Fiery Pro Server and Fiery Access to correct for device drift. He'll also um, touch upon um, the G7 curves and how G7 can help you um, get better color results, also why and when to use it. And then um, last but not least is also how to improve and make uh, multiple devices better. But before we get started, we do have a few questions for you. So let's take a poll. You should see um, three poll questions on your screen right now. Please take a moment to fill these out, and I'll give you a moment to do that. So while the answers are still coming in, um, let's get started with our session, and we'll touch upon the uh, poll answers in a little bit. So our section for today, as said, is color process control and verification in Fiery Pro Server and Fiery Excess. John, it's all yours. Thank you, Ellie. Thank you, y'all. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today. I'm going to start with a little bit of background on process control. What exactly is it and why might you be interested in implementing process control in your facility, in your workflows? Well, I'm going to start with a very dry explanation. This is from Wikipedia. It was on the internet, so we know it's accurate. And it says process control deals with architectures, mechanisms, and algorithms, which basically means processes and math, for maintaining the output of a specific process, that would be our output devices, our printing devices, within a desired range. Okay. Now, a key item here is maintaining the output. You should consider using process control to keep your system in control, not necessarily monitoring it so that when it goes out of control, you take corrective action. You should be thinking about taking corrective action before your system goes out of control. It should not be a, oh, it's broken, we need to fix it. The key is that you want to stay in production. And using process control is really the, the only way you can ensure that your system stays in production, that you don't have any downtime. Well, what is this desired range? Okay, the desired range is often an industry specification, such as FOGRA 51 or 52, ISO coded or ISO uncoded, or swap or grackle. Depends upon where you live in the world. Might be Japan color. But we've got all these different industry specifications that different um, governing bodies, such as FOGRA or ISO or ID Alliance, have come up with. Okay, And you may want to conform to one of those specifications, or it might be demanded from your customers. I know even on the, uh, the, the, the grand format side, uh, where it used to be just, hey, pleasing color, just looks good, we're happy. Uh, more and more are now asking for verification to an industry specification. Okay? Now, 
not covered here is, or actually, uh, in addition, visual appearance. So if you don't conform to an industry specification, it's going to be a visual appearance, an overall teasing color or maybe uh, accurate gray balance. Okay. Uh, also, of course, we want to make sure spot colors are accurate. More and more, that's becoming important and being something that the customers are demanding. Okay. Now, what we're talking about today is color process control, color process control, color accuracy. We're talking about density, hue, and saturation, the three criteria to make sure any one color is accurate or an overall job is accurate. Not covered here, but equally important, are resolution, clarity, speed, mechanical issues of your output device. Okay? We want to make sure that those are correct also. But what we're talking about today, what we're monitoring really is the color accuracy. Okay? So if color is no longer accurate, well, what changed? Okay, uh, we, we're, we're failing verification, uh, we're, we're all of a sudden out of control or we're getting close to out of control. Hopefully you catch it before you're out of control. So what changed? Well, the first thing is your printer functioning properly. Go check the heads, make sure everything's fine, make sure you don't have uh, heads that are blocked. Next would be device drift. Did something change on the device? Now, it might be that actually something was changed on the device itself. Maybe you print so much that you wore out one of the print heads and that was changed. Likely that's going to change the color. New media often might have an impact on the color, especially if it's a brand new media that you're first testing. Well, that's possibly not going to look uh, or react the same as media you have been using. New ink. Now, this can be a little difficult to determine that uh, it's the cause of the problems, that color has changed. Because when we change ink on our system, the very next print off our output device likely is not using that new ink. It takes a while for new ink to go through the lines, enter the heads, mix in with the ink that's already in the heads, displace that ink, and then become more and more of a factor. Uh, so that's difficult. You could be printing today and also going, oh, I, gosh, I'm suddenly failing verification. What's going on? What changed? And boy, nothing changed today. Did anybody do anything this morning? No. How about yesterday? No. Well, it might have been last week sometime that someone uh, 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 changed an ink cartridge or added more bulk ink to one of the bulk ink containers. So new ink is a little more difficult to determine that it's the, that it's the cause. That's why it's good to keep a log of things that, that happen on your machine. Now, if you ever see this sticker on your media or ink, you know you may have issues. That, that's one of those things that can ruin your day. Oh, good, new and improved. Now I've got a lot more work. You are at minimum going to need to test before you start running production work, Okay, if you ever see that sticker. Well, so printer functioning properly, that we, we can check. But uh, device drift, what exactly is going on there? Well, in the world of color management, let's say we have this particular patch. It's a, it's a, it's a reddish patch. Okay, fairly saturated. And we know from our reference profile, whatever reference profile we're using, that CMYK recipe on a press run to that specification gave me this LAB value. Now, LAB simply means what does the color look like. If you're unfamiliar with LAB, at the end of today's session, we're going to have a link and information to go back and view our past sessions. And one of our first sessions we ever ran a, a couple of years ago was on uh, color management fundamentals, and we covered color specifications and all that. So refer back to that. But for today, just keep in mind that LAB, that specification, means that's what it's going to look like. Okay? So I take that color, what it's going to look like, and let's assume it's a particular pixel on this red apple. Okay? And it's that color. Well, in color management, we take that LAB value and we send it through three IECC profiles to, in this situation, three different inkjet printers, or it might be the same inkjet printer with three different media, or maybe different ink and media combinations. Well, that ICC media profile will come up with a correct recipe. Note, the recipe is different that is actually being sent to the inkjet heads. Well, things change. Uh, inkjet heads, there's wear and tear on them. Uh, depending upon the, the type of material you're printing on, temperature and humidity might, might play uh, into the situation of, of having changed color. So all of a sudden, well, this device, well, we're not getting the same color. It's kind of a little lighter and it's a little more on the orange side, a little away from the red. There's a little more yellow in there. And 
well, this device, this device drifted a little darker and a, a little on the cooler side. There's a little more cyan in there. That's what we're talking about when we say device drift. That it's, it's, a, it's a small change. I've exaggerated here uh, just to make sure that we understand what's going on. But it's a change in something. Again, it might be the device, might be the ink, might be the media. Now, if this is suddenly what you're getting for that color, something's broken. This is, well, you could say this is process control. We certainly caught that. But it's uh, likely something uh, serious has happened, maybe uh, corrupt software, maybe a big change to the printer, maybe you ran out of one ink or or something strange happened. So if, if, you, if this is the problem, don't look at taking the corrective action that we're going to go over next, such as relinearization or reoptimization. Something serious has to be taken care of first. Okay? So we need to detect the problem. How do we detect the problem? The best is to use a spectrophotometer and measure a color bar. These are two examples of color bars, one from FOGRA and one from the ID Alliance. And when we select a specification for our particular workflow, we say, I want the output to look like this. I want it to look like it would look if I printed that file on a press running to ISOCODED or FOGRA 52 or GRACKLE, whatever it is. We measure that color bar, and the software should automatically compare the LAB values, remember what the color is supposed to look like of each of these patches, to the specification we have selected. And then it will report to us. And notice in this reporting column here, we have a number of items that are not OK. This device then is out of control. And now I can't ship work until I fix it. That's not what we want. We want to notice that the values that I measure, which will be this first column, are starting to get close to the tolerances, the ceiling I have set. Okay, and I want to take corrective action before I start to get not okays. All right, well, what if I don't have a spectrophotometer? Then what can I do? Well, then you're going to have to take a look at your subject in some type of a controlled lighting condition, ideally a light booth with the correct lighting. Uh, if you don't have a light booth, at least make sure it's repeatable color. Don't look at it under, well, we've got fluorescence over here. Then I went to the front office with a customer, and we just had uh, basically daylight coming in. And oh, then I went to, to uh, her office at night, and she had tungsten lights and, and, and different kinds of lighting in her office that we were looking at. That's just going to completely uh, invalidate any uh, color verification that you're going to do visually. You need to have repeatable controlled lighting conditions. Also, this image that the woman is currently evaluating is not the type of image you want to use for process control verification. You want something like this, something that's got a lot of different colors, pastels, saturated colors, memory colors like grass and sky and water, uh, skin tones, neutrals. You want a lot of different colors that you can look at in order to validate that, yeah, overall the color looks accurate. Best is to use a spectro and measure uh, a color bar, but if you're going to do it visually, control lighting conditions and make sure you set up a variety of uh, images. You would print this set of images when you know your de output device is running correctly and you're happy with the color, and you take that and you store it in a drawer. And then a week later, uh, two weeks later, it's up to you to determine how often you need to do this test, but then you would reprint this document, compare it to the original that you stored in a cool, dry place, and see if you would still accept the color. All right, so that's a little background on what exactly process control is. Uh, if you have any questions today, please use the Q&A, the question and answer window. And again, we'll, we'll have time at the end for hopefully uh, all, if not many, of your questions. And if we don't have time for your questions, as you all said, we will send out uh, written copies of all the questions and answers to everyone on the webinar today. Ellie, do we have the poll results? Yes, we do. They should be popping up right now. And the survey said, all right. So, um, all right, most of you have no, most of you want to keep this a secret. OK, well, well, you, you could have said something. We wouldn't tell on you. Um, we've got a number of people uh, validating against Grackle, uh, probably about 
close to the same for our Fulgur 5152, a little bit for Swamp. Uh, visual pleasing colors. Some of you also are doing visual pleasing colors. So again, um, take a look, watch as I go through the verification, and hopefully you'll see that this has um, some value to you. How often do you verify? Uh, let's see, most of them are once a month or less. Uh, that might be the pleasing color people. We've got some are doing it after every job. And again, the, the, the idea of process control is you want to do it regularly. Uh, less than once a month, in my opinion, is not regularly enough, if the, unless the only thing you're doing is, well, my inkjet head spit out ink on my, onto my media. That's my limit for process control. But if you've got any kind of tolerancing at all for accuracy, you're likely going to want to do it more often than that. <clears throat> and the majority... Well, the majority wouldn't answer, but the majority of those that did answer are currently using EFI Color Verifier. So uh, oddly enough, from EFI, we're very happy to see that. So let's keep those poll answers in mind and move on when we look at now what is the Color Toolkit. What do we, EFI, make available to you, our customers, in order to do process control? <clears throat> Well, it starts out, our solution starts with the Color Verifier option, okay? It is an option, hence the name, Color Verifier option. It is included with many Fiery Pro servers, okay? I'll show you, uh, when we look at the interface in a little bit, a very quick way to check to see whether you have a license for Verifier. Uh, if uh, you can't launch Verifier, it means either you don't have a license or you didn't uh, uh, add a license. You'd want to check with your dealer, make sure if you have purchased the license, it's added to your system. And if you don't, contact your dealer or contact EFI, and we will tell you how you can add Color Verifier to your system. Okay, so verification will tell you in control, out of control, getting close to out of control. Then we need to take our corrective action. And we have a number of tools. The relinearize, the relinearization tool is the first one we will look at. Then there's optimization, and finally, uh, just doing visual curves, a visual adjustment. Now, visual curves are also used for the G7 curve process that uh, Ellie referred to in the introduction. Now, all of these color tools, everyone gets. If we take a look at the interface, here is the basic color tool set. And you'll notice we have optimized profile, relinearization, and the visual correction. And if you have added color profiler, same options. We, of course, have all the options for uh, building uh, new profiles and editing and inspecting profiles. But uh, you can always optimize, relinearize, and make a visual correction. All right, let's talk about color verification first, which is process monitoring by the numbers, okay? And these are delta E values. Again, if you're not sure what delta E is, go take a look at some of our past uh, webinars, the, the ones on fundamentals of color management. But delta E is basically a way that we can mathematically give color an accuracy value. Okay, it's a number. The bigger the number, the less accurate the color. Delta E is always, at minimum, comparing two colors to each other, one color to the other, okay? Might be comparing this to this, okay? This is the patch off of my uh, reference value, and this is what I just printed on my output device. How close are they, okay? And delta E will tell us how far off it is. And you can have a delta E value that's showing you you're off in hue or saturation or brightness. Usually it's a combination of all. But again, the bigger the number, the farther we are away from what we want. Now, there's two basic kind of groupings of delta E we look at. First is average delta E. Let's take a look at this first patch. And let's say the delta E from this patch, from ID Alliance, said that it should be a particular LAB value. And we measured it off of our output device, and it held a delta E of 4. Let's say the next patch had a delta E of 2. If we took only those two patches and averaged them together, we'd say, well, our average is delta E of 3. So that's what we do when we average. We take a number of patches, might be the entire target here, and compare them and average out all the delta E values to get what our average delta E is. Might be only the CMYK values. Might be only the gray balance patches. Okay? Then there's individual colors. Also, we have something called peak delta E, which is how far off is the single worst patch. Okay? But individual color is just that. It compares that cyan patch to that patch. What's the delta E? Now, the standards and specification uh, boards that we deal with give us tolerances, okay? For instance, on this particular tolerancing method, the average for all the patches is supposed to be three or less. 
The maximum for any specific patch is supposed to be 6 or less. And we have delta E, there's delta H, which is just delta hue, delta T, tone, that's darkness. So we've got a lot of different things that the uh, standards boards can tell us that they think we should monitor in order to make sure that our color is accurate. So again, this could be an industry standard or it could be your own. Might be a house standard. And that might come into play because you might be asked to print on a media from your customer that it, it just can't pass any of the specifications. It might be a media that, for whatever reason, it's just a very dark media. Okay? And a dark media, well, the white point likely isn't going to pass to uh, FOGRA or ISO or ID Alliance or any of these specifications. So you might have to save your own. This might be kind of an inside pleasing color, but yet you can do pleasing color by the numbers. We'll talk about that in a bit. So we're talking about using color verifier in order to come up with this uh, color accuracy. It is a data comparison tool. Color verifier takes data from one source and compares it to data from another source and gives us the delta E values, but even more important, gives us an overall pass-fail. Okay? It can be set up to be done automatically or manually, and we use it to verify to often a standard. It might be a data set, okay? FOGRA, ID Alliance, ISO, they, they publish these data sets and they say, if you say you're going to print to ISO coded, that color bar should look like this. Okay. Might be an existing ICC profile. You could have a proofing system set up to match your press, and maybe your press doesn't conform to any of the specifications. Okay. Uh, well, then you could use an ICC profile from that and say, I want my proofing system to verify against that. It might be an existing proof, something you already ran in the past. This might also be the pleasing color method could also be a press sheet. If you have the same color bar printed on a press sheet and on an output device from your inkjet printer, as long as the same patches, you could measure them and compare them. Okay? So there's a number of different things that you can use as your target for color verification. Okay, well, let's take a look and see how this actually works. I've got the interface for Fiery XF, and I want to take a look at doing uh, color verification. Okay. So I have my output device here, and if I take a look at the workflow, if I go to the Verification tab, you'll see that I've got my ID Alliance color bar selected, and I've got it set for the Epson Spectra Proofer. And I've got my Epson Spectra Proofer here in my testing lab, and I want to conform to Grackle. So all of these are set. A lot of this is set by templates when you first set up your workflow. Now, I could, because I have this verification checkbox check, that's telling XF that I want to do color verification. Now, can I do color verification within XF? If you look along the top, this little icon, it's got the green checkbox. That is the verifier icon. If it is green, it means you have a license for verifier, and you can do verification using that program on your system. If that icon is gray, that means it either is already launched, or it means you don't have a license for it. So if it's already launched, see who's using it, make sure you've got it. If nobody's using it and it's grayed out, contact your dealer to find out how to get a license for color verifier. Okay. Now, I can also have, because I selected the spectro proofer, I could have this system automatically verify jobs. If you have a built-in spectro, you can print the job, it can measure the color bar, and it could print no, print label after verification. I can check that box, and now my XF system will automatically print the pass-fail delta E information as the footer of the job, cut it off, move on to the next job. Okay. I can also say stop job printing after the first job verification fails. That means if a job fails, well, let's say I have this queued up to print you know, uh, 50 jobs overnight, and on the 10th job it fails. Well, I don't want to print another 40 jobs and come in the next morning and find out I've got to throw away all that media and all that ink. That's kind of expensive. So I would want to make sure that if a job fails, to not keep printing. So now I've got automatic verification set up and running. 
one key thing you want to keep in mind, I want to call your attention to the output device here. And under special, there might be a dry time. And many of the manufacturers recommend allowing your ink to dry back for at least a couple minutes before you measure a color bar. Uh, especially on my Epson here, the, that can make a difference between my, my color bar passing or failing verification, especially in yellow. There's a change during the first, well, few minutes uh, once ink is deposited on your output device on an aqueous inkjet printer. A lot less of an issue on, on uh, UV inkjet, but an aqueous inkjet, make sure you let that uh, media dry for a little bit before you measure the color bar. All right, so uh, what happens with verification? Well, I'm going to go to the Job Explorer, and I've got a few jobs here that I set up for verification before I started today. And one says, OK, this can be verified. And if I look at the verification panel, notice here are my tolerances. These are from the ID Alliance for Grackle. And I've got nothing measured. I didn't measure this color bar yet. Okay, So therefore, approved, not approved, I have no idea. Here is what I want to see. Here I've got my tolerances, and notice they're all OK. All of them passed, and this job is now OK. I could print out the label and print it on a sticker and put it on the back of my proof and send it off on its merry way to the customer or to the press shop if I'm actually printing a proof. Now here's one where verification failed. Uh, let's see, well, that's OK. Oh, right there, maximum of all patches, 6.1, where the tolerance is 6.0. And it says, not OK. And also yellow, well, look at that. Yellow is 6.10, also not OK. Uh, maybe that was an issue where I didn't let it dry long enough. You may want to remeasure a color bar if it fails the first time. Give it another couple minutes and then measure, especially if it's just right up on the edge, like 6.1 versus 6.0 is just at the edge. Now, that's still pretty high. And if I saw that, I would likely want to take overall corrective action, but I could maybe just get my one job out quickly if I remeasured or if I optimized and reprinted. Now, I'm going to go into optimization in a little bit, but keep this button in mind when I go through that because if a job fails optimization, you can click on this call, you can click on this button and XF will take the LAB values from the color bar that it measured look at what the LAB values should be compared to the reference uh, information, and it will make a correction file. Likely, if this is only 6.1, if I click Optimize and Print, it would pass the next time. Okay? So Optimize built in is very, very, very handy. And again, everybody always gets the Optimize. Now, if I just have this job that was can be verified, I can click the Verify button, and the Verify button is the same thing as launching the verifier button from the top here. It launches the verifier program. And any job that is ready to be verified will show up in the interface. Let me wait for it to launch here. I'll bring it in. So here we can see the color verifier interface. And here is this job that's ready to be verified. Now, number of ways I can do this. Let's say I want, I, I, I'm not using a recognized uh, industry standard, OK? I, I don't do FOGRA or ISO or, or ID Alliance or any of that. But I printed a job, and everybody was happy with it and signed off on it. You could click Measure and measure that color bar, and then do a file, Save, once you've measured it, and save that data. Now you could come in and click Open and load that reference data set, and then click Measure and measure the new color bar. Now you're measuring the current color bar to what color looked like when you did the visual approval. Now, if you're comparing to an industry specification, it gets even easier because you can have different workflows set for different uh, reference values, even different measurement devices. And what a lot of people do is they click on this, and, OK, what is this job? And OK, I think I used my ES2000, and I think this was a Fulger 52 or whatever it was. It's a lot easier than that. All you need to do is double click on the job, and it will load the correct reference values. Here's the reference values from Grackle. And it said, well, I don't have mine connected, but it's looking for the ES2000. It would prompt me to calibrate the ES2000 measure the color bar. And once I've measured the color bar, then I get a pass or a fail, and I could click Send. Now remember, this is client-server software. So you could have an intern off in a cubicle somewhere that their job all day long, all she does is go and grabs proofs, 
grabs output and measures it and gets a pass fail and prints out the stickers. Okay? You can also, I'm going to click on preferences here, you can set up your own standards. Uh, let me cancel this job for a moment. I can get in here. Okay, that's fine. All right, uh, it's still locked in because it's waiting for me to measure. But what I could do is I can set up defaults here, a default measurement device and which chart I want to measure. But in comparison settings, I can set my own. Okay, I can select, here's average for all patches, maximum for all patches, and you've got a whole slew of these that you can pick from, and you can set your own delta E values, and then you could click save, and whatever you save then, that tolerance limit, that will come up here in the interface. You can select that for the workflow. So that's how you can set up your own, your own system, okay? Now, once your job is either verified or fail verification, as I said, you click send, it will go back to the interface, and it would then show you that it verified or verification failed, and you can then take a corrective action. Now, one other item I want to call your attention to, and that is the dynamic wedge. The dynamic wedge is a different kind of a color bar. Normally, our standard color wedges look like this. They've got gray balance patches and reds, greens, blues, and oranges, and 50% tints, etc. Well, take a look at this job. This is what I want to verify. Where is blue in here? Uh, where is you know, 50% uh, uh, gray, a 25% tint to gray, a 25% tint of cyan. Well, they don't exist, okay? So what we have in Fiery XF and Fiery Pro Server is the dynamic wedge. It's exclusive to our RIP. And in the dynamic wedge, you select it, and you can set it to use process colors or spot colors or both. And what it will do is it will on the fly build a color bar using the most common colors in the job. Now you're verifying the colors actually in the job to the color bar or to the, to the specification. Okay? And notice there is my spot color. My little fiery red is right there. That's a separate patch. This is a great way to verify spot colors are accurate. Uh, that's starting to become something that we need to do. The new FOGRA specifications now require you to verify the accuracy of spot colors coming from idea lines, etc. We're all going to be needing to verify spot color accuracy. If you look at the interface here, you select the dynamic wedge. It's only available as control strip one. You select what device you're using, whether you want process and spot or only one or the other. Again, how many patches. You can do 16, 32, 64 patches. It will always, if you have spot colors and process, it will always include the spot colors first. And then it will use the rest of the patches to make up whatever else you're going to use. Okay? And then you can set the spot color tolerance. Then when you print a job, it will examine the job and it will actually show you the CMYK recipes and list the Pantone colors that are being used to build. So take a look at the dynamic wedge, especially if you're using any of the new specifications where we need to verify the accuracy of spot colors. Okay, so we did this, we did everything we need to, we verified, and it's not accurate. We found out that it's wrong. Well, now what? Okay, first and foremost, check that output device. Make sure the output device is running correctly. On our Vutex and other printers, we have uh, files that are pre-ripped that you can just call up and print out. That basically takes everything out of the equation except the printer, the media, and the ink. And if that prints correctly, well, then you know it's something else. If that doesn't print correctly, but it's not that blue color that I showed you on that, that uh, third printer, uh, the earlier the webinar, but yeah, color's just not quite right. Okay, then you need to look at relinearization or optimization possibly. Now, relinearization resets ink limits. How much ink do we spit out of our heads when we say, I want 100%? It adjusts the primary curves, okay? The, the color of inks that you're using, uh, it adjusts those curves to be exactly what it says, linear. Right now, we don't have support for ViewTech or uh, actually also for uh, many of the EFI printers. The wide format of the only printers that we do have relinearization available for. So any of you uh, ViewTech, Reggiani, Matan, uh, uh, customers, you're going to look at reoptimization or uh, a few other techniques that I'm going to talk about. 
Now, reoptimize anybody can use, and that's a per patch color adjustment. It adjusts for hue, saturation, chroma on a per patch basis. Okay. Let's take a look at relinearization first. It does exactly what it says. Now, it may adjust this solid, you know, uh, up or down to make sure it matches the density that is logged into the header of the calibration file, and then takes this squiggly output, which is going to give us bad color, and relinearizes it, makes it a linear output again. Okay? Now, it's limited in what it can repair. It, you, you have to be careful in saying it, it fixes color, because here I've got just it's too much ink. Okay, it's printing a little darker. Well, that it can fix. But here, up, new batch of ink. The batch has been reformulated. It had that sticker on it. And sure enough, this ink is a little redder than it used to be. Linearization cannot fix this. Okay? All it can do is make sure it's linear. All right, let's take a look at relinearization and how this works. I'm going to go back to my system manager. I've got my output device here, but take a look at my linearization device. My linearization device is not set up yet. And I would need to take my information for my, linear, for my device, what device is it, how is it connected, and go to the linearization device and plug in all this information. This is where a lot of people mess up their licensing. Because if you enter anything incorrectly, it's going to yell at you. And it's going to say, uh, you don't have enough licenses. So the easiest is, I know I've been printing to my Epson uh, printer, and I know it's functioning correctly, so I'm going to right click and say, relinearize device. And it says the settings will overwrite the linearization device. I say yes. And now look, it's my Epson, and there's my IP address. And I'm going to click on linearization. It's all been copied and pasted there. Okay. Also, the media that I currently have selected is, if I bring this relinearization interface over, that is the relinearization or the linearization file that it automatically selected. So it saves a lot of time, corrects for or prevents errors if you can select it that way. Okay. Now, I simply say, what device am I going to use to measure? It defaults to the same one that was used to build the calibration file. Okay. Uh, if I'm using the spectro proofer, that's, again, one of those built-in spectros, I can say optimize for a number of counts or a particular uh, average delta E. Uh, be careful about setting that too high and or that too low and then leaving for the night, or it may never reach exactly the tolerance that you want. But next, I would say print. Okay. And rather than printing and waiting and measuring, I'm going to import data. I've already uh, gone through this process earlier. And I'm going to bring in the first target that would have been measured. XF looks at the LAB values and compares it to the values that are stored in the header of the file. And it says, ooh, my average delta is 7 and my peak is 20. I actually put the wrong media in my printer to make sure I could get some high numbers and, and fail this so we could go through the process. But it's saying further improvement is possible. Well, I certainly hope so. It says click re-ink limit and relinearization. That means re-ink limit. It thinks the solids, the solid cyan, magenta, yellow, black, etc., are incorrect. And it wants to reset those. It may just find that those are correct. And it may say just recommend relinearization. Then I would check this box. But I'm going to say re-ink limit and relinearize exactly what it tells me to do and print. And now I'll import that first measurement, which is this one. And this tells the system where I am starting from. Okay, I click Next, and here are my same delta E values. It hasn't done any correction yet, other than in the background now. It's reporting this, but it did change the solid ink densities to try to match closer to what I had in my calibration file. I say Print, Import Data, and bring in that one. And notice my delta E values went down. I say Good, and I optimize, and print again and import the data. And I keep going eventually. Notice I've dropped quite a bit here from 7 down to 4 and from 20 down to 15. Eventually, this will say, I don't think I can do any better, and you're finished. When you are, you simply click Finish. And it says, do you want to overwrite the existing linearization file? I'm going to say no, because that's going to mess that up. Uh, Yes, I want to leave the linearization step. And if you saved over your original linearization file, this workflow that's using that linearization file automatically got updated. There's nothing else you have to do. Your other option is to save it as a new name, and then you have to come in and reselect things. Okay. So that is relinearization. Now, 
what happens when, when we look at relinearization again? Just kind of a recap. Here everything's kind of yellow. Here everything's kind of light. Here everything's kind of dark and blue. That's the kind of thing relinearization could help. But take a look at the second chart. This particular patch, well, this needs additional saturation, and it needs less yellow. But this patch needs more yellow. Well, I need less yellow and more yellow. And this patch is darker. It needs less yellow, and it needs more magenta. If you try to do that with, with curves or uh, just linearization, it can't do it, OK? This needs optimization to fix this. So what is optimization? Well, it fine tunes that transform, that conversion from one ICC profile to another. Let's take a look at an example. I've got this particular magenta-ish patch, and I say I'm printing the Fogra 51. Well, Fogra 51 says that patch recipe, when printed, should give you this LAB value. But you know, I printed it on my output device. I got this LAB value. It's different. So what the optimization process does is it comes up with a correction. If it ever sees this LAB value, it says, hey, make this correction, subtract 2 l leave A alone and add 3 to B, send that new recipe to the printer, because then when it prints, it's going to wind up being the LAB value that I want. Okay, it's a fairly straightforward process. Let's take a look and see how it's done. Again, everybody gets optimization, no matter whether you have the color profile or not. Now, when we get in there and take a look, we're going to be asked to do a couple things. One is target patch selection. How many patches do I want to print in order to do the optimization process? The most common for proofing is 1,617 patches. That's the same number of patches that is often used to build ICC profiles that we use. And I know many of you that use uh, handheld devices, such as the S2000, your shoulder is already starting to give you a little uh, discomfort thinking of 1,617 patches measured multiple times. Well, in production, often 928 patches getting by with fewer patches. But I also want you to consider 234 patches, very useful in production. And some of my proofing uh, customers, some of our dealers, are also testing and have found very good results with the 234 patches because it does built-in smoothing. What happens is inside an ICC profile are anchor points. There's a, there's a color specification for every color patch you measured. So let's say we measured 1,617 when we built the profile. Well, now I'm using 234 to, to um, optimize. Well, what it's going to do is it's going to specifically optimize the 234 patches I measured, and it's going to take all the colors in between each of the colors that I measured and optimized specifically and kind of massage them and bring them along for the ride. And that can help smooth out potential errors in measurement. So consider that 234 patch target for optimization. All right, let's take a look at optimization in the interface. I'm going to go in and I'm going to launch Color Tools. Okay? And in my Color Tools program, I've got the full program, so I've got them all. I'm going to go into Optimize Profile. Now what I do to optimize is I select the workflow. I'll select my Grackle workflow. It'll automatically load everything. Here's where I select the chart. I'm going to grab that 234 patch target. Here's where I have to select the optimization method. Well, I don't have an optimization file in my workflow, so my only option really is to create a new one. I could also optimize an existing one or put the optimization file into the profile. Most common is create a new one or update an existing one. Then paper white setting. Default is absolute colorimetric, because a white point simulation, if it's off, can have a big impact on color accuracy. You could also say suppress paper white, which is kind of our way of saying relative colorimetric, or keep current paper white. If you've edited your paper white simulation, it's probably one of the most common ICC profile edits we have is, gee, everything looks good except the white point's a little off. Well, if you edited that, if you optimize, it might kind of optimize out that correction you made. So keeping the current paper white no change will lock that in. All right, once we have our settings correct, we go to Next. And then we will print out the color bar. And I'm going to import the data and optimize for webinar. And again, this is my starting point. Nothing has changed here yet. I've got an average of 2.7, a peak of 8.5. Paper white is less than 1. That's good. Target and gamut is 96. I'm going to cover these in details in just a bit. But I'll say, OK, well, let's optimize. 
And the optimization process happens, and I reprint the target, remeasure it. I will re-import here, number two. Oh, look, my, my average went down to 1.3. That's nice. My peak dropped uh, a couple more than two delta E. Paperweight even got a little better. Target and gamut will never change. Optimization doesn't change the gamut or the capability of your output device. Relinearization can, but optimization does not. Well, hey, it got better, so we optimize it again, and then we reprint, and we can continue doing this forever. Remember I said optimization or relinearization will eventually tell you that's it, you can't go any farther. That's as good as I can get. Optimization is not the same. Optimization, you can just keep going uh, until you decide that's it. It's, as, it's good enough or it's well within tolerance or it's not getting any better. But notice my average now is 1, my peak is down to 6, etc. So when I'm finished, I could say finish. You sure you want to save that one? I say yes, I want to save that one. And I will save it as WebEx. Save it. You would normally save it with a name that means uh, something uh, as far as the media, because you're really optimizing that particular media. So then I go to my workflow, and under my workflow color settings, there is WebEx selected, because I said, yes, I do want to use that for this workflow. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that that optimization file will work with any reference profile with that media, that ink, that printer combination. So a lot of people think, well, if I have Grackle and Fogger 52 and ISO coded, I have to optimize them all if I'm going to the same printer, same media. Not the case. All you need to do is optimize the largest color space and then use that color space for all of the other workflows that use the same media. Okay, so what exactly are we going to try to hit here? Okay, well, ideal values. Average delta E, ideally we're under 1, peak under 5. Media is going to have a big impact here, however. Okay, the delta E of the white point, ideally under 1. Target and gamut, if we're doing proofing, that's going to have to be 98 or better in order to get a good proof match. If it's production, uh, the target and gamut, it's going to be, as I said, so dependent upon the media. Okay, obviously... The higher the target gamut and the lower delta E values, the better we are for a color match. All right, um, G7 curves and gray balance. Well, how does this come in? Well, this is kind of a, a little different way of relinearizing or re-optimizing. Now, uh, G7 curves are traditionally not needed in color-managed workflows, ICC profiles do what G7 curves do. If you go to the ID Alliance and look at the documentation, it says so, but they still do have a value, and that is only correcting the grays. It okay? uh, doesn't matter what specification, it can help you match grays better. It's, it can be used for a gray recalibration and also can help you get a, a fast, close enough match between printers. What we're talking about here is the G portion of G7. G is the G7 curve. It's in the world of XF and Pro Server, it's the VCC, the Visual Color Correction Curve. The seven part, which is cyan, magenta, yellow, black, red, green, blue, our primary and secondary colors, that has to be taken care of with an ICC profile. A G7 curve doesn't fix that. The procedure is very simple, and I'm going to go through it very quickly because we're actually going to have a G7 session later on this year on how to incorporate G7 curves into our system and go into more details on building this. But you basically print the G7 target, which is called the P2P target, through your workflow with color management turned off. And then you measure it. It can be measured with a, a handheld like an ES2000. You can manually graph the curves you need. Okay. Or you can use a program. This is uh, Curve 3 from Chromix that is being used to generate the curves. But somehow you generate the curves, and then you would either go into the relinearization tool, the visual relinearization tool, and simply build the curve. Add the points and build the curves. Or from a program such as Chromix, you can export, actually, a VCC curve directly. Drop it in the balance folder and select it. And now you have your gray balance accurate. And since most customers would accept jobs if the gray balance is accurate, unless they're real sticklers and saying, you have to measure a color bar, prove to me it conforms to Grackle, uh, making sure the gray balance is correct can be very quick because all you have to do is every once in a while reprint that target with color management off, rebuild that curve and drop it in, and you're back within gray balance. Okay, You just select it in the uh, visual correction, and you're good to go. 
how often do we have to do this? Well, relinearization or building a G7 curve as you detect device drift. Or again, new media or new ink that you did add that you know, or you got that new and improved sticker on there. Whenever any of that stuff happens, you have to monitor and see, do you have to do relinearization or fix your grayscale curve? But it may not work. Now, again, on our Vutex and uh, Reggiani and Matan right now, uh, we don't have relinearization. We will in the future. We are working on a process for all of uh, our customers with those printers. But you may need to do a new media ICC profile or a new calibration set in that situation, calibration set, an EPL calibration file, and an ICC profile. Often a new media profile can get you right where you need to, to be. So take a look at just building a new profile using your existing calibration file. How uh, about optimization? Now, optimization is often used more in the proofing side of the world. Okay? And again, there you're going to want to monitor those, those verification values because that normally means that you've got uh, real tight standard specifications, something you can't visually look at and say, gee, is that, is that magenta patch correct or not? You want to follow the pass-fail criteria, and then where you're starting to get close to failure, do a re-optimization. Okay. Uh, barring that, visual changes. Again, take a look and decide when uh, you're, you're starting to notice visual differences. All right, well, how about matching multiple output devices? Well, there's two methods. The simplest is aim each of them at the same specification, from FOGRA, ISO, ID Alliance, your own press proof, something like that. Sometimes that works, sometimes that doesn't. And here's the problem. Colorimetrically, they could pass. Hey, that looked good. But visual, well, I compared from my two printers, and I don't like the way they look. Well, how can that be? They both pass to, you know, in this case, Fogra 52. Well, I take my desired color and I print it on these two printers. And let's say the delta E is 4 on this particular patch. Well, hey, I'm delta E3. I'm in control. And this is delta E3. So that's great. But between the two, maybe I'm delta E6. Well, my tolerance is delta E4. So I visually notice a difference between the two, even though each one conforms to the specification. So here's how you can fix that. You need some kind of a profile viewer, because you have to determine which printer has the smaller gamut. So here I've got it in the uh, profile viewer in our color tools program with the color verifier module. And I would pick the printer that gave me the smaller gamut, and I would optimize it. Then I would launch the optimizer again and select the second printer, or a workflow connected to the center printer second printer, and check this Use Optional Additional Characterization Data. Check that box. Click Select. Then you go to your Working Folder. Here's the path it shows. And you find the folder that is from the first optimization job that you just did. And inside there, you're looking for three CC files. Fire EXF, Fire EPRO Server, save these interim CCC files. Every time you hit optimize and print, it made one of these temporary files. And you find the one, normally the last one, that you were happy with the results. And note the timestamp. Then in that same folder, and sort by type, you find the IT8 files. Those are the measurement files that were saved when you actually used your spectral. Find the one that is right before the timestamp of the 3CC file, because that's the IT8 data set that was used to build the 3CC file that gave you the good results. And you load that file. You can't load the 3CC file. You have to load the IT8 data set. Now what you're doing is you're not comparing the both printers to FOGR 51, for example. You're comparing the first printer to FOGR 51, and you're comparing the second printer or trying to match it to as closely as we can, the capabilities of printer 1 to hit FOGR 51. And often that results in a better color match. So what have we learned today? Well, we learned to start process control. You have to do process monitoring. You have to figure out some way, ideally a spectro, if not using a, a visual reference uh, to verify the accuracy. Color verifier is a much more accurate way of doing it. And you use relinearization for course correction. Course not like course of a ship north, south, east, west, but uh, overall like a coarse sandpaper versus a fine sandpaper. Optimization is the fine tuning of the correction. Okay? And you ideally want to take corrective action before you're out of control. You want to stay in production all of the time. Consider using a G7 curve 
for a quick gray balance uh, modification, quick gray balance, bring the gray in control. And we also learned that there's a couple different ways to get a better visual match to get one device to look like the output from the other. So a lot of tools for you to work with. Go give them a try, and uh, we expect you'll be very, very happy with the results. Ellie, back to you. Thank you, Gnome. So we have a few second resources for you. Um, um, so XDRIVE's Complete Guide to Color Management is a, a good base to um, answer quite a few questions around color management in general. We also have a link to the recording um, of a video, an educational session that Don Hutchinson did for us, the inventor of G7. He did that video at Connect, um, at EFI Connect in Las Vegas. And um, it gives a very good introduction. We have a lot of questions around G7. We'll try to touch upon a few of them later in our Q&A session. But this could be a good start to watch that video. And we also have a link to our help.efi.com here. A lot of information are, is in there. There's a knowledge base there. There's more information around color management, G7, technical documents, specific information on uh, drivers, etc. And then, of course, we also have the links to the recorded webinars that we had as a pre-learning to the session. And there were three sessions um, re with related topics. These other two sessions, if you haven't seen them yet, um, they would be very um, advisable to watch. Of course, we don't only have these uh, recorded webinars. All of our webinars are available on um, our um, website. Um, the link in this presentation will be a live link. Uh, we will be sending the presentation to you um, after the webinar in a few days, together with the recording of this session. Um, but you can also go and look at some of these other topics that might be interesting for you. And last but not least, we have additional World of Fiery sessions coming up. Today we have the color process control and verification one. Next up is May 3, is your RIP working hard enough? Where we'll give tips and tricks um, on how to make the RIP work faster and better and um, more smooth for you with less touches. So we'll touch upon uh, four different areas, color, usability, automation, integration. And then we also have a specific webinar on G7 on September 13th, where we'll be talking about how to get your gray balance in check. Um, definitely a good one to sign up for already um, for the people that have been asking more questions around G7. We also have our webinar calendar um, available. This is also a live link. Um, every webinar that we plan gets posted there, so do keep an eye on that one. And if you have certain topics in mind that we have not covered yet that you would think um, you would like to hear more about, um, you can fill out the Have you, Your Say form and um, submit those topics to us. And we'll take a look at them and the most popular topics do get um, nominated for topics in our series. Well, there's, there you have it, a lot of great information. So as Ellie and John begin looking through the questions, I want to go through a couple of reminders. Um, as Ellie mentioned, uh, we'll be getting um, information to you within a couple of days um, that will include um, the recording, link to the recording, a uh, set copy of the session presentation, as well as an FAQ document with all the questions and answers. We'll try to get to a few of them uh, right here. We'll stay over um, so that John can address some of your uh, great questions. Also, as a reminder, as you're leaving our session, take a minute to fill out the survey. We do look at those um, uh, that input that you provide and uh, take that into consideration for future sessions and in general in making these um, as uh, great as possible for you, our audience. So um, with that, Ellie, uh, let's get going with a number of the questions that we got. Yes, we actually had um, 
quite a few questions. I think we've had a record number of questions ever. So um, we will only be able to touch upon a few of them. Um, as said, um, everybody will get an answer to their question, even if it's not answered right now. First question, is it possible to do a G7 calibration in FIRE except right now? Uh, well, not directly. What uh, uh, That will be available in a future release of the program. But right now, what you would need to do is build the calibration file, finish the calibration file, and before uh, you build the media profile, print the P2P target using only that calibration file. And then you would use that combination of the calibration file and the G7 curve to now have a gray balanced calibrated state and use that to uh, build your media profile. That's all detailed in the documents in the help.efi.com section. We've got uh, one on how to do that exact process uh, manually and another one, or I should say more generically, and another one on how to use the Curve 3 program. And it would work the same in Curve 4, which I believe they just released to, to do that process. In a future release, uh, we will be able to do a G7-based grayscale calibration right within the program. But right now, it's a little more of a, a multi-step process. So one more on G7. Um, how do you track your spot color along with standard G7 on a daily basis or per job with FIRE 6 or 4? Well, for G, let's take them separately because there's nothing really involved in uh, G7 and spot colors. G7 is really for process, making sure the, the, the grays are neutral. Um, the color verification, uh, the standard strip from the ID Alliance would be used to measure. Uh, if you're doing spot colors, you would select the dynamic wedge as color bar number one. And then for color bar number two, you would select the ID Alliance color bar, depending upon uh, whether you're using the older uh, 2009 or 2013 specification. And that would be aimed then at Grackle. The, LA, the um, spot colors are aimed at the LED values from the library. And again, then you can uh, optimize those if they're off. So you really take them as two separate, uh, separate entities. There's no G7 really for spot colors. That's uh, just look at the LED values. Uh, think of G7 more for process work. OK, next one. How long can you store your reference color bar in a cool, dry place? Would the color bar be replaced over time? Well, like every answer for every question in color management, the answer is that depends. Depends upon what kind of ink was used, what kind of media, where it's stored, cool, dry place. I've seen people store it in cool, dry place in a plate setting room. And after about a week, it's like, what on earth happened to my color bar that was stored in a cool, dry place? It was actually dark in a, in a, uh, a drawer, but there was this, uh, all these fumes that just caused problems. So the best is to measure the color bar and save that reference data set as your first data set, because that's stored as a digital file. And back that up, because then even if the color bar fades or changes, you've always got the data to go back to and verify against that. You can always then call up that color bar and compare it to the measurement of the color bar from a day, a week, a month, a year ago, and see, hey, how much did my ink and media change over time? Um, one more. Can you measure the delta E of a specific spot color library? Well, to measure a spot color library, you'd actually have to print out the entire spot color library. Um, and we don't really have anything built in to measure the accuracy of the whole library. Um, I'm not sure it would be a valid test anyway, because you could have uh, you know, X number of colors. I mean, the, the XF comes with over 32,000 spot colors in the library. Uh, and, and to be able to measure all of those, you'd have to build some kind of a target that has the, the uh, named spot colors or the, or the LABs. Um, there's only X number of named spot colors you can have in any one file. So uh, theoretically, I suppose it's possible, but nothing within uh, Fiery XF or Fiery Pro Server that allows you to do that. 
So let's take just a couple more. I want to respect everybody's time. And again, um, to those of you who asked a question and we're not going to be able to get to it, we will get back to you um, individually and also include all questions and answers in an FAQ document that will be available within a few days. So um, Ellie, just two more. OK, thanks. When using except in combination with laser printing, it's difficult to keep the color correct. Is it possible with laser printing? Well, we only support a few laser printers directly. It's on the supported printer list. Most of what XF supports is the toner or is the uh, the inkjet uh, products, uh, fiery fiery command workstation, which uh, by the way is what uh, XF will be running under. Uh, late this year when we have our next big release. So look forward to that coming out when we're starting to become more one big happy family. But uh, a Command Workstation, Color Profiler Suite also comes with Verifier, and there are processes there that you can use to keep toner devices in control. The problem with toner devices is they're very sensitive to the environment. Uh, they work on basically static electricity, and that's impacted by temperature and humidity far less of a problem on on inkjet printers. So you could use this with a toner, but only the, few, the very, very few toner devices that we support. Uh, toner devices from Oki, and I think there's maybe a couple from Xerox in there. So the last one for today was, um, I don't think I have the tools that he's explaining. How can I find out? Well, the easy way to find out is there is a if, if you go down to the XF control icon, your little it's on it's on the server, a little pop up, or it's in the dock in Windows or on a Mac. And if you right click, you can select Show Licensing Information, and the licensing information I'll bring mine over here that I just brought up. And here's the color profiler option. Yes, I have a license for that. There's my verifier option. I have that. You should have the options for optimization, relinearization, and the visual, because everybody gets those. The question is whether you have the verifier options. So if you select Show License Information, uh, it will tell you. And then uh, if you don't have it, just contact your EFI dealer uh, or EFI directly, and we can work with you to get the products that you would like. We can also get you a license so that you can test them for a month and make sure they're going to work for you without spending any money. All right, so we are at this point going to call it. Um, I know, again, there are many questions left out. Um, we will um, make every effort to get back to you very quickly. Um, we want to thank our audience for joining us and sticking around. There's um, always more questions, I think, <laughs> than we can ever get to, but um, we do make an effort. We look forward to seeing you in May. We'll be sending out uh, information about uh, that uh, session very soon. Um, so look out for that. We'll uh, um, be happy to have you join us then. Um, and with that, thank you, Ellie and uh, John, for a great session. And uh, have a great rest of your day. You're very welcome. Thanks, everybody, for coming. And uh, look forward to seeing you at the next webinar. Thanks, everybody.